Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman of the Football History Dude Podcast, and I'm stopping by this show real quick to tell you about a couple of cool giveaways that we have going on here at the network. Both are autographed books covering various topics of the NFL. The first is The Point After, How One Resilient Kicker Learned There Is More to Life Than the NFL by ex-NFL kicker Sean Conley. It goes over his unique experience as a walk-on kicker at the University of Pitt after never playing high school football. And then it gets into some of his time playing for NFL teams and so much more beyond the gridiron. The other is from author Kevin Bryant. His book is titled Spies on the Sidelines, the High Stakes World of NFL Espionage. This book started as a curiosity, kind of a passion project to understand everything revolving around well, Spygate. But this put Kevin down a rabbit hole learning about all sorts of espionage that has occurred throughout the history of the NFL. Both permissible <laughs> and often the illicit techniques of gathering intel to try to impact the outcome of the game. To sign up for your chance to win an autographed copy of one of these books, all you gotta do is head over to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash giveaways and sign up. That's sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash giveaways. Again, check out all the other podcasts that we have in the Sports History Network as well. But now, back to your regularly scheduled journey to the Sports History Timeline. In this episode, we go back almost 125 years for a historic recant of how the game day tragedy in Georgia almost ended early football. The game was preserved by the most unlikely of sources under the circumstances, and we have the story coming up in just a moment. This is the Pigskin Daily History Dispatch, a podcast that covers the anniversaries of American football events throughout history on a day-to-day basis. Your host, Darren Hayes, is podcasting from America's North Shore to bring you the memories of the gridiron one day at a time. So as we come out of the tunnel of the Sports History Network, let's take the field and go no huddle through the portal of positive gridiron history with pigskindispatch.com. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hello, my football friends. This is Darren Hayes of PigskinDispatch.com. Welcome once again to the Pigpen, your portal to positive football history. And today's Gridiron story was inspired by a pretty cool book titled A History of College Football in Georgia, Glory on the Gridiron by John Nelson. And I read this piece, which is a collection of different football stories from uh, the state of Georgia, especially uh, in the college ranks of uh, football. But it's got other stories in there too, but a really neat book. But it gave me the inspiration uh, of this one story that really caught my eye. Uh, A name that I had not heard before, Richard Vaughn Ablade Gammon came to light early in the book. Gammon was a player on the 1897 University of Georgia football team. Think about the game of American football in 1897 for a moment. You know, 22 men were lined up in close quarters before every play with very little protective gear. You know, there was no real line of scrimmage. They could line up head on head on each other. And the substitution rules gave very little relief of taking a breather in between, uh, you know, plays or for, you know during the contest. You know, they were basically smash mouth football on steroids as every play was a running play. And there was, you know, just mass plays of humanity coming at one point trying to take out one defender just to gain an advantage. The legal forward pass would not be looked at in the rule book until at least 1906. So this is some nine years before that. And it really would not be an effective option until 1912 as it was limited. And we've talked about that before. Now, Georgia Bulldog football had its start actually in 1892 as the squad played two games in their inaugural year. This was the Georgia Bulldogs' one and only season under the guidance of head coach Charles Hurdy, the so-called father of football at Georgia. This time was a 50 to nothing shellacking of Mercer. Georgia's second game of the 1892 season was against Auburn, which marked the beginning of a rivalry that would later become known as the Deep South's oldest rivalry. This contest was played at Piedmont Park in Atlanta and it ended in a 10-0 victory for Auburn. So Georgia ended 1-1. 
Fast forward back to the 1897 season. Georgia was competing in the Southern Intercollegiate Athletic Association, the SIAA, and their schedule considered uh, of three games under first-year head coach Charles McCarthy. Georgia beat Georgia Tech for the first time and met both Clemson and Virginia in their first meetings ever. Week one, they blanked Clemson 24 to nothing on October 9th at Hurdy Field in Athens, Georgia. A couple weeks later, on 10-23, they again played at Hurdy and once more whitewashed an opponent, this time Georgia Tech, by the score of 28 to zip. In the season finale, it was played at Piedmont Field in Atlanta against the University of Virginia. The Bulldogs suffered a devastating loss to UV, 17 to four, but what was far worse was what they lost a player, Von Gammon, when he died from trauma suffered in the contest. The death rallied football critics around the state and a formal ban of the game in the state of Georgia was laid on then Governor William Atkinson's deaths from legislatures in the House and Senate of the state, needing only the governor's signature to outlaw the game from being played in the state of Georgia. UGA, along with Georgia Tech and Mercer, disbanded their teams after the tragedy and the Atlanta Constitution even posted the headline of death knell of football, marking the end of the game and the future of football in the Peach State looked gloomy at best. Now we have that, that actual, uh, from newspapers.com, an embedded version of that uh, article from the Atlanta Constitution. And it says, death knell of football, Georgia legislators are bent on abolishing the game, may pass an anti-ball bill. Strong sentiment among the assemblymen against the sport. Gammon's death, the primary cause. And that was from the November 1st, 1897 edition of the Atlanta Constitution. Now, football was saved from certain doom uh, from a somewhat unlikely group, Gammon's family. Vaughn Gammon's own mother, Ms. Rosalind Gammon, wrote a letter to her local representative pleading for the sport to be made safer and continued as the best memorial to her son. According to John Nelson in his book, that letter from Mrs. Gammon read, quote, it would be the greatest favor to the family of Von Gammon if your influence could prevent his death from being used as an argument detrimental to the athletic cause and advancement at the university. His love for college and his interest in manly sports, without which he deemed the highest type of manhood impossible, is well known by his classmates and friends. And it would be inexpressibly sad to have the cause he held so dear injured by his sacrifice. Grant me the right that my boy's death should not be used to defeat the most cherished object of his life. Dr. Henry's article in the Constitution on November 2nd is timely, and the authorities at the university can be trusted to make all the needed changes for all possible consideration pertaining to the welfare of its students if they are given the means and the confidence their loyalty and high sense of duty deserves, end quote. Powerful words indeed from Mrs. Gammon. She didn't want the very thing that her son enjoyed so much and ultimately killed him to be banned, but in in her son's name, uh, she wanted it to be revised. Governor Atkinson read the letter and then agreed with the grieving mother and college football in Georgia survived. Had Mama Gammon not written that letter of revision request, who knows what the fate of football would have been in Georgia and in the South in general, and who knows, it could have spread to the rest of the United States because there was great uh, uh, opponents against football in colleges. There is still a long way to go to make the game safer for participants, even today. But in the spirit of Von Gammon's family wishes, manufacturers, rules makers, and coaches all over the country, and the players just playing a much smarter game, still strive to make player safety their number one goal to make it uh, safe for everybody so we don't have any more of these deaths or horrific injuries that are occurring. That's our dream that we all have, and we, we hope that they, someday we do see it and that these injuries are part of history. And we hope glad that you joined this little bit of history to remember a very special lady and a very special man that uh, died playing the game of football and uh, helped to start reform in the game of football as we know it. So I uh, hope you join us each and every day for some more great football history. And uh, we will keep on posting every day for you. So till tomorrow, everybody, have a great great iron day. That's all the football history we have today, folks. Join us back tomorrow for more of your football history.
we invite you to check out our website, pigskindispatch.com, not only to see the daily football history, but to experience positive football with our many articles on the good people of the game, as well as our own football comic strip, Cleat Marks Comics. Pigskindispatch.com is also on social media outlets, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and don't forget the Pigskin Dispatch YouTube channel to get all of your positive football news and history. Special thanks to the talents of Mike and Gene Monroe, as well as Jason Neff for letting us use their music during our podcast. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. offices of the Pittsburgh Guardian newspaper circa 1924. But for Marla Delft, assistant editor, everything was about to change. For she was about to discover the awesome attractiveness of Row 1 brand retro sports paraphernalia items thanks to Orville Mulligan, sports writer. And there it is. Wow, Orville, that's really the bee's knees. Isn't it just? A poster-sized replica of the actual 1909 World Series program cover. I can see that. But where did you get it? And where did you get it framed? I ordered it from the Row 1 website, where over 6,000 items of sports memorabilia from the 1880s to the 1990s are available for reproduction in multiple sizes and in several different materials, with over a dozen styles of frame to choose from for prints like this. Well, I'm sure Mr. Delft would love to put up more of these in the office. But I'm equally as sure they're beyond this newspaper's budget. (laughs) <laughs> Not at all, my dear Marla. See for yourself. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. Sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. Oh my, these are good prices. Oh, and look at this stuff. Oklahoma, Nebraska football. College basketball art. Michael Jordan items. And so Retro it was that Marla Delft discovered Clifford? the spondiferous magic of row one sports memorabilia arts and prints. You can, too, by visiting sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. That's R-O-W number one today for access to the full row one catalog of gallery prints and gifts like t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, telephone cases, coffee mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Act A for a 15% discount off all prints with coupon code SHN15 and 20% off all other items with coupon code SHN20 at Check out and keep your dial locked to the Sports History Network for the exciting chronicles of the 1920 sports world in Orville Mulligan, sports writer, coming soon.